it's quite an honor to come back here. Uh, I first heard about the Calera Coalition when I was an undergrad at Colorado State from uh, Richard Knight when he was my senior professor. And I attended one conference immediately after I graduated and then haven't been back since. So it's kind of cool to, to come back, do a full circle, and then come talk to everybody. Um, like, I, like they said, I'm going to talk about our wildlife management program and how we, how we manage the ranch as a whole. Um, but first, I've got to kind of give you the history of the, the ranch itself. Um, Bermejo Park was actually once part of the Mac Miranda Maxwell Grant, which was about a, just over a million acres in size. Um, in 1902, uh, Mr. William Bartlett, a grain merchant from Chicago, purchased the original 300,000 acres. He purchased that ranch because one of his sons was actually diagnosed with tuberculosis, and they kind of he felt that the drier air from out west would help his son. Um, he started the cattle operation with 6,000 cows, um, built the Casa Grande Lodge, or the Casa Grande House, Casa Minor, and the original Costillo um, Lodge. These buildings are actually still back on the property. Um, elk had been extirpated in the area, so he reintroduced the elk herd into that area and built some fishing lakes for his guests and stuff like that. Then in 1926 through 1946, the Bermejo Club uh, is kind of a special club, members only type of club, owned by politicians, uh, movie actress, actors and actresses, uh, and businessmen, um, owned the property until the Depression. Um, they still had cattle operations throughout the 1930s. And then in 1948, Mr. Gorley uh, purchased the, the ranch and then he added additional acreage to the ranch, maintained the cattle operation, um, refurbished the, the Casa Grande, Casa Minor, and also built some other infrastructure there, um, restocked the lakes, brought more elk in from Yellowstone, and actually reintroduced bison into the area. Um, then in 1973 through 1996, Pennzoil owned the, the ranch. Um, they maintained that guest operation. Uh, they added more acreage, 190,000 acres. They expanded that cattle operations. I've heard rumors between <coughs> seven and 8,000 head of cattle at one time. Um, then at the end of their ownership, they actually donated 100,000 acres to the public uh, via the U.S. Forest Service and the Bayou Vidal um, unit up there. Then um, Mr. Ted Turner uh, purchased the ranch in 1996. Um, at that time, at that purchase, the ranch was just over 585,000 acres. Um, he removed all the cattle uh, operation from the ranch and strictly started to raise bison. Um, it still maintained our hunting and fishing operation and we kind of changed our management strategy to managing for economic sustainability and environmental values. Um, there was some um, coal bed Cold bed methane exploration that is occurring on the ranch, but um, it's actually one of the better operations um, in the West uh, with Titan, uh, Atlas Titan Energy. Uh, well, what makes Vermejo special pretty much is the amount of land it covers. It starts in the short grass prairie all the way up to the uh, alpine tundra elevation, starting about 6,400 feet, going all the way to close to 13,000 just shy of uh, 12,890 on State Line Peak, which is actually in Colorado. Um, the ecotypes, several types, of, several ecotypes on the ranch. Uh, Ponderosa pine is the is actually the largest privately owned Ponderosa pine ecosystem. Uh, it constitutes about 32 percent of land, or um, just over 187,000 acres. Pinon juniper. Uh, Gamble Oak shrublands is about 22 of the land cover area. Higher up, mixed conifer and aspen, uh, about 16% or 93,000 acres. Again, the short grass prairie, about 10%, 58,500 acres. And then you gotta mix in the riparian, large vega grasslands, and the higher alpine tundra. Uh, we also have several lakes, all of them are man-made. Um, Class A fisheries and 
alpine lakes. The class A fisheries are, are lakes that we maintain and stock for guests guest, uh, opportunity to fish. All the alpine lakes, those are all stocked with the native Rio Grande cutthroats, and I'll actually talk about that program later on. Um, it is, it's also the, the headwaters for three major watersheds, the Rio Grande, the Purgatory, and the Canadian River Systems. So like I said, when Ted Turner uh, bought the ranch back in 1996, uh, it came with a mission statement, and that was to manage Turner lands in an economically sustainable and ecological sensitive manner while promoting the conservation of native species. Basically, that means to try and bring them back to what they were prior to man is, is, an over, is the overall message while maintaining native species on the land. But because we are a guest relationship or a guest ranch, uh, we also have to abide by our, uh, another mission statement, and that's to efficiently manage its diverse native ecosystems, i.e., the Ted Turner, uh, in a profitable and sustainable manner, but provide a fulfilling and rewarding experience for employees and guests while highlighting its unique surrounding operations. And so, my department, the Natural Resources Division, is kind of the, the land managers in that aspect. Um, the Natural Resources Department as a whole is to provide uh, support to BPR by helping balance ecology and economics through monitoring and environmental resources. Um, our Natural Resources Manager does a lot of the range monitoring on the ranch. Forestry, forestry and manage the forestry infrastructure related to natural resources restore ecological processes. This includes um, creating fire breaks, uh, prescribed fire uh, in that aspect. Fisheries provide high quality recreational experiences for guests to generate revenue for the ranch and while supporting the efforts of native uh, river systems or water systems. And then my job, of course, is to manage BPR's wildlife resources in a profitable and sustainable manner, emphasizing quality and assist in ecosystem management while providing an enjoyable experience for its guests, owners, and employees. So that's kind of what, when they told me that's what I was supposed to do and not to be, I figured I was going to be out in the woods all the time, but apparently not. <laughs> so as a department, we collect a lot of data. Um, we have a large data set, historical data set. Uh, one of the things that we look at is the preset that the ranch receives, receives not only on a calendar year, but during a growing year. And in that growing year, we define as uh, October 1 through September 30th. Um, we have several uh, rain gauges throughout the, the ranch and weather stations and collect that data as well. This year was phenomenal for precip. If you guys were, have been up in the northeast part of the state, um, I don't think any one of our rain gauges got less than 20 inches of rain. Um, some areas, one of them I believe behind the wall, which is actually one of the areas that receives the most precip, got over 30 inches of rain in one growing year. Um, so then we take that into account, and then we also collect uh, production data. We have several uh, plots throughout the, the ranch. We go out and collect whatever what the forage production for that growing year, measure it, and then we come up with how many a, uh, animal units the ranch can sustain. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of our data set here, um, the precip, is actually was measured out of our headquarters area, which is our most consistent uh, data gathering center. Um, but you can see on the right the the production that produced with the precip that following year. 2011, 2012 um, was a drought year for us, um, but then 2013. And I guess that this year was a record year for precip that we received on the ranch. We're still analyzing our data for the 2016-2017 grow year, but I'm guessing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm guessing it's going to be right around 19,000 or 1,900 pounds per, per uh, acre. Of course, that can change because we never received this amount of precip in a while. So. Um, <clears throat> like I said, we do a lot of range monitoring. Um, this is an older photo. Um, this was a western wheatgrass pasture or meadow in one of the uh, old mining areas. And this was in October. Five months later, pretty much gone. 
The reason for this was actually the fact that our out population was about 10,000 to 11,000 animals on the ranch at that time. Um, <clears throat> another area of the ranch, um, Castle Rock Park, uh, you can see the changes that we saw in a six year period. 2008, it was more of a grassland type meadow. 2014, it turns into a pretty sage meadow. <coughs> Again, during this change, uh, the elk population was at its highest, probably close to 12,000 animals during that, that six year period. Um, and then, of course, we had the drought follow in 2011, 2012. So that was that, that change in the ecosystem there in Castle Rock. Just some more rangeland pictures that we that, uh, some different monitoring sites. Uh, some of these are post drought or during the drought. Some of them are uh, post drought. So the information that we collect um, and the data that we get, we kind of determine what our carrying capacity is, not for a good year, but actually for an average dry dry year. Um, and so we can make management decisions regarding our the bison herd the elk herd, the mule deer, and the pronghorn, the, the animals that are going to have the biggest impact on the landscape. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with the bison because, oh sorry. The bison herd we have the most control of. Um, the Castle Rock bison herd is actually a genetically pure bison herd, and um, we like to keep it that way. The, term, the Turner Bison Program has full control of what, how many animals we can they shipped off into to finishing for market and, and uh, how many they want to keep on the ranch. Right now, <clears throat> we feel that the, there's about 1,400 to 1,500 head of bison, um, 1,600 breeding females, that includes um, the yearlings and breeder bulls. We do an, the reason why we have a, the best idea on our bison herd is we do an annual roundup of the bison herd, usually in the early spring, uh, about mid to late March. Every animal is ID with three different types of IDs, uh, electronic ID, a metal tag ID, an ear tag ID, and they're entered into the, the bison uh, database. And so wherever that, that, happen, that individual goes, if it goes, stays on Bermejo or goes to another Ted Turner Ranch or goes to the market, it has a trail. And so we're able to, to adjust our bison numbers a little bit more easily because of that. Um, that program. The most numerous ungulate is the is our elk herd. Um, we use a aerial survey system, a random point system on our, our aerial surveys every year. We do our surveys in late September. Um, we kind of the reason why we choose that period is because we feel that the elk are more dis dispersed throughout the ranch. They're not concentrated, and you're not going to get bias. Um, in your numbers and, and counts and stuff. And so you can get an idea on the areas that the elk are utilizing more when they're more dispersed in that uh, fall time versus the winter when they're gonna be concentrated on winter grounds. Um, right now, actually, this number might be a little bit off. 8,000 to 9,000 animals, we're probably more 7,500 to 8,500 animals. Um, mature bull ratio, Mature bull cow ratio is at 56 to 100. What this, what we're striving for with that mature bull is our trophy quality. We are a hunting ranch, and we want to strive for opportunity. Um, we have several guests that come every year. They've been coming for 20 years, and they like to see the elk numbers. Calf cow ratio determines on our recruitment rate on our on our elk on our elk population. Um, Literature, we go, I try to stay by the literature, but anything above 25 to 30 um, cows per 100 cows, the population is probably, is more likely stable. If it drops below 20 into the teens, we're worried there has to be a problem in the herd because we're not getting the recruitment, we're not replacing the animals that were harvested for our hunts. Um, 30 and above, the population is actually going to start increasing, and so we have to take another look at our management program and decide if we need to start reducing our output. <coughs> Mule deer is a little bit difficult. Um, anecdotal suggestions is that there might be about 2,000 to 3,000 mule deer on the ranch. Historically, it was probably a lot higher, more like maybe 3,000 to 4,000 animals. Um, 
What makes it difficult is is their habitat selection type. Um, so when I got hired there, they asked me to try and get a better idea of the mule deer population. And so being a, trying to be a good researcher, I implemented a mark recite pilot survey to determine um, the, the mule deer population based on habitat type. Um, I enjoy hunting, so I decided to go hunt with a paintball gun. Um, it had been done before uh, via aerial uh, markings with uh, elk, mountain goats, and bison. Needless to say, it was a fun hunting season, but my success rate was actually pretty low. Only marked 29 deer. Um, and then I was supposed to follow, and then I tried to follow it up using a road-based survey um, to count how many marked versus unmarked animals I saw during a survey route. Unfortunately, weather played a, a bad uh, influence on my survey, so that wasn't it. I wasn't able to get out. I did deploy 44 cameras, and I learned one thing about that. I need to have a very well-paid intern to look at over 10,000 pictures for me. <laughs> but um, that again, that, like being a researcher, uh, being educated as a researcher, I, I learned that I need to alter this a little bit more and get a, a little bit more detail into that. But we have an idea on how on how and where to set up for next spring. Pronghorn surveys, um, I implemented a road-based distance survey. Um, you're wondering, well, why does your survey go through most of the, the western half of the ranch? Well, during the drought, we actually had pronghorn migrate northward and establish themselves in Castle Rock, and they're regularly seen through those, the pink and the green of canyons of uh, Bandera and Mercedes also. So um, I implemented this survey, and we got a rough estimate on what, what our pronghorn population was. And we're actually starting to see the, prong, the pronghorn move into areas that you wouldn't expect. Um, they're kind of starting to show up in some higher elevation areas. And we're actually wondering if they're ever going to make their way up to the highest elevation meadow, which is the Costilla Vega. Um, some stuff that we look at annually with that survey is the number we see per survey. Of course, the, the buck to doe ratio, the fawn to doe ratio, and then at the bottom is my rough estimate on what, how many uh, pronghorn there are on Vermeco. And like I said, this is important as part of my job is to ma maintain that quality of animals. Um, Vermeco Park is a hunting ranch. Um, it has been and will continue to be because we have no large predators. We, there's no grizzlies, the historical grizzly, the wolves on the on the landscape. So we have to be that large predator by managing those ungulate numbers. Um, and we harvest our animals based on the scale of animals available. I always get asked, well, how many elk do you get har harvest? Well, we harvest between 500 and 600 animals a year. Um, trophy bulls, management bulls, um, we base our quality based on a Boone and Crockett scoring system and trying to maintain that high uh, scoring system. If you are unfamiliar, um, it's just a bait, it's a measurement of the antlers the animal has. Um, last year we harvested about 117 trophy bulls. Um, the average was about 306 and uh, 28s, and as long as we can promote that, this is what we have. Um, we make our management decisions based on that. Management bulls is a little bit different. We put a score there, but we're after those older age class bulls, trying to get them to remove those animals that are not going to be appealing to a trophy hunter. Um, they're going to score low. They're older age class animals. Um, we're looking at animals hopefully 10 years or older. They've passed their prime. They're, um, they're just out there trying to remove them from the landscape, make room for future generations, make sure that they have food. <laughs> this, <clears throat> that is more for um, herd control and herd management. Um, cow elk are the producers for the herd, so if you reduce more than you need to, your, your herd's going to decrease. Um, last year we took 474 adult cows, uh, which is, you know, ages one and older. <laughs> And that calves do get taken because legally in New Mexico you can kill a calf that does not have an antler. 
And unfortunately, accidents happen and sparks do get taken out as well. So this goes in, this harvest data goes into our population uh, model along with the ratios that we see in September and then we can kind of estimate <coughs> what our what our population is. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing that I that I saw when I moved to Vermejo um, was this large data set and just how the quality that, that we were able to increase changing our management actions. Um, in the first 20 years, this is only a 20-year graph, but in the first 10 years, or 15 years, 1996 to 2008, we harvested maybe 250 cows um, and harvested about 200 bulls. Well, then in 2009, the goal was to reduce that cow herd and try and improve the quality. And almost, almost immediately, we saw that happen. In 2009, um, we started harvesting close to 500, 500 to 600 cows started bringing the, the, the elk population down, reduced our bull harvest, and we saw our bull quality start to increase. Um, the two lower ones that you see post-2009, those are actually lag effects, I believe, from, from the drought that had occurred the year before. But right now, it seems like we have increased our age class and our herd quality as well. Um, herd conditions, so we don't just go ahead and just kill all our elk. Like some people think, we actually use the data from the from the cow out that are harvested and do a herd health condition assessment. Um, we look at field dress body weight during early season and late season. Um, we look at the age class, age structures for the cows. Um, we want to make sure that a majority of our cows are actually about 13 years or younger. Um, some data suggests our data suggests that after the age of 11 their productivity goes down. Um, you know, like many other ranchers know, if your cow isn't producing, you want to replace her with somebody who's a little bit younger. Um, before, um, before we started doing that, our age class was actually in the, I believe, 10 to 11 years of age. Once we started reducing, we actually removed those older cows and started getting better herd ratios, uh, cat cow ratios, ensuring that, that our management was, um, doing what we wanted it to do. Um, we look at the pregnancy rates. Um, so the hunters bring in the, the uteri from the cows that they harvest, look at pregnancy rates. Again, that's an age class type type thing. We want to see that seven to, or three to seven years of age to be at least 90% pregnant. If they're not, then we have a problem. We can make our adjustments on, on, the, on our management side. Um, lactating again, we look at lactation levels. That basically means that that cow that was harvested, she should have, she should have produced a cow that or calf that year and successfully <coughs> weaned it to into the into the following season. Um, and then some more, like I said, uh, with with all our harvested animals, we still collect all that same data. Um, Trophy mule deer, we look at the age class and the, the antler scores, management deer is more age class like the management bulls. Pronghorn, we're actually pretty conservative and we're looking to increase that because we've actually seen the quality um, drop a little bit in the last two years. So we will actually probably increase our harvest on that to see if, how that will change. And the reason for that is based on the data that we've collected, um, pronghorns actually bring up their um, show their, their true horn development between the ages of two and three versus a mule deer, which will show its true potential between the ages of five and seven. For, for bull elk, it's between seven and 11. So we look at those, like I said, we look at those age class structures to ensure that we're, we're trying to raise mature animals for our hunters to harvest. And we also maintain a good age class for following years. Um, but we are more about than just killing animals, like I said. Um, one project that we got started was actually with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and our neighbors to the north, the Tercio and Hills Ranches. Um, I got interested in this project because we do habitat improvement, and so I want to look at habitat use preferences, um, response to logging. We have a logging program, but we do that for um, habitat improvement, fire break, and um, 
And then, of course, on pressure effects, how do we hunt versus how does Colorado hunt? And how, the, how do the, the, that affect the elk movements? It's a two-phase project. Uh, phase one, we actually captured cow elk, assessed their nutrition, and determined the pregnancy. Um, pregnant cows then received a GPS collar and a vaginal implant transmitter or a DIT. Um, this was done in, in early March. Um, we were able to deploy 23 collars. Um, we did lose one throughout the, the last six months. Um, it was due to a mountain lion. Um, we get GPS fixes every six hours and then they shift from two hours uh, starting in May and June. And ideally the vet was supposed to help us relocate the calves that were born from those pregnant cows, but we had a, a, a hiccup in that connection. Um, this is kind of just a series of, of pictures on how it went about. This cow was captured in a, co in a clover trap. She was then tranquilized and then assessed for her pregnancy along with her nutrition. <coughs> it was determined that she was pregnant. She's going to receive a vit and then the collar. And there's some movement data that we, some early movement data um, from the cows that were collared. Um, most of them seemed to stay around the, the area, but then we had one individual who within two days after being captured said, I don't like Colorado, apparently they're doing something crazy in here, I'm going to go to New Mexico. Um, and then she ended up spending most of the time down in New Mexico. Um, as you can see, as, as summer went out, um, they actually distributed themselves quite a bit throughout the area. Um, that cow that was near headquarters actually moved into Castle Rock. One actually went above Timberline. And so um, we're going to repeat this process uh, in February and March and hopefully recall our, some, or add to our sample size and check the assessment on these collared cows to see if they were able to get pregnant uh, a second time. Um, phase, the second phase was the neonate phase. Um, ideally, the vet was supposed to drop. We go and collar that calf as soon as it was born. Like I said, there was a hiccup. Um, we only caught one with the vid. Um, but we were able to capture uh, opportunistically 55 calves. Uh, 16, 16 of them have actually died. Um, 13 were actually due to um, predation. And several collars were actually dropped prematurely along the New Mexico-Colorado state line. And you can see why they're pretty much hanging out in that, in the, right out the state line. Um, again, we're going to continue that project in 2018, and then and once that da data is analyzed, then we'll try and reevaluate what we're going to do in the future. Some non-game wildlife projects that we conduct are is a collaborative uh, bird survey with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, they came out for the last two years and uh, done bird surveys on Bermejo down in the prairie section. That's of interest because we use the, the prairie as winter grazing for our bison herd, and so we can start to look at those grazing effects <coughs> in terms of the spring count curves that if they continue with this survey, we can then adjust our grazing plan down in the, down in the prairie if need be, if indicator species no longer show up in those surveys. Um, last year, they counted over 30 different bird species in those surveys. Um, Something that Ted Turner, like, like it says in the, in the statement or the mission statement, is to ensure native species thrive on their property. Um, the Turner Endangered Species Fund leads these projects. Um, this one is the Black Footed Ferret reintroduction that has occurred. Um, they've started that in 2012, and it's, it's been mediocre success. They're trying to figure out what is actually, we did experience a plague breakout in one of the Gunnison Ferry dog towns where one of the, where the ferrets were released. So they're gonna go back and reevaluate um, that program. A, a success story from the Turner Endangered Species Fund is actually a, a larger project, a collaborative project with New Mexico Game and Fish, um, Bermejo Park Ranch, and the Rio Costillo Basin. Right now, the Rio Costillo Basin in Bermejo is home to the largest uh, Rio Grande cutthroat uh, trout population in the world. Um, and so we tried to implement that to guess as to what we were doing on, with that program. Um, sorry, I ran out of time, but 
this year another success was we were actually able to put fire back on the ground. Um, we conducted a prescribed fire with the, the Nature Conservancy. Um, we had two burn units. One was about 420 20 acres, and we were able to burn, burn about 50% of that. And then one that was almost 440 acres, and we were actually able to burn 70% uh, of that due to the conditions that were presented during the burn week. Um, our goal is actually to do a larger scale uh, burn prescribed burns in the future, whether with the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy or other partners, um, to return that, that native fire regime back into the ecosystem. Um, oops. Sorry for that. Thank you. <laughs>